Buonasera, buonasera amici di Giovedì Scienza, a questa a questo nostro incontro. Good evening, good evening to you all, good evening to all our friends from Giovedi Scienza Science on a Thursday. Welcome to this special meeting. Here we have Professor Eugenio Coccia. Professor Coccia is here to talk about uh, the important news, that is to say, over the past few weeks, um, the Italo-French Virgo, which is in near Pisa, in a place called Cascina, is once again working and is 10 times as sensitive as it was before. That is to say, it is comparable to the LIGO uh, in one in the United States, uh, oh, which have also been improved in terms of the sensitivity. This is all very important, and Professor Kocha will explain why. And in any case, uh, it's easily understood uh, that three are better than none and uh, three are better than one, and he will explain why. Uh, Professor Kocha has been working on gravitational waves uh, for a very long time. If, he, if I'm not mistaken, you started with Eduardo Amaldi, who spent uh, his later years of research uh, um, studying gravitational waves. As you know, in 1915, Einstein had foreseen all this, uh, but it was only proved 100 years later because there had been indirect proof of it uh, by two scientists who got the Nobel for this, Houston Taylor, uh, many years ago, but um, it was uh, an indirect observation, but directly was only observed in 2015. The second news item that we have this evening is uh, the establishment uh, of an inter-university international center, uh, which um, is, has been named after Arnold uh, and after um, a physicist, an Italian physicist that you all know because he was one of the founders of Giovedi Scienza, uh, Tullio Regge. So it's called the Arnold Regge Center. There are many points in common uh, between these two scientists, uh, very good mathematicians, uh, very good physicists, uh, and both uh, have uh, had um, a leaning towards the popularization of science. There are many other more subtle ideas, but these are the most uh, straightforward ones. Both of them were enthusiasts uh, and loved uh, communication and science. Uh, Arnold, uh, I used to say, he said, the task of a teacher or of a lecturer is not to fill bags, but uh, to light flames. And this gives, gives us an idea of what a master uh, does. You don't have to fill the students with information, but you have to kindle their interest and then let them go on. And their route, I'm sure, will be creative and different, which will develop uh, what the master probably only began, because that is what science is. It's something which never reaches an end. So you have to take the bat on and run on. Professor Kocha carried out and directed experiments in the Gran Sasso Center, and he has been the recipient of many awards, including the Giuseppe Occhialini uh, Prize. Arnold Regge, Regge Gravità. Arnold Regge Black Holes and Gravitational Waves, Eugenio Cocha, who is going to talk now to us about these matters. I will be talking about uh, the discovery of gravitational waves, as was mentioned, uh, and also being in Turin, uh, a city which I love for many reasons, uh, and uh, there are many friends of mine here. I will confess a little. I will... Uh, the first one is that when there was the announcement, or just before the announcement, uh, but when the, in the Virgo LIGO group uh, we realized uh, there was, it was an extraordinary emotion, especially amongst those of us who've been working at it for many, many years. It's a bit like to seeking for the Holy Grail, and after many years, without knowing 
In fact, when we started, we didn't know if we'd ever find it, but finding it after many years. So it would like to convey the feeling that we had, the joy of discovery. To be able to tell you the story in such a manner that you will appreciate it, uh, I would like to start uh, with this trans slide that shows the sky and the stars. You see the depth, the, how it conveys the idea of the infinite, of how small we are, and also the fact that there is a deep silence in the universe. We can see these lights, but we can't hear them. We can't hear anything. The discovery of gravitational waves can be thus described, that from now on, universe is the universe is different. We can perceive vibrations, uh, vibration of space, uh, which ripple out at the speed of light and which depends on how the source waves uh, behave. The comparison is as if uh, we were suddenly able to hear. Clearly, we don't hear sound because a sound is, com is conveyed through air, but it's through space we perceive ripples. It's not really empty. It's as if it were a flexible medium. This flexible medium is deformed, and the waves ripple as if it were a gel or uh, the top of a pond. So the idea is that from now on, the universe is less dark. Because we can understand more, we can perceive signals where there is no light as if in a dark room. We can't know. We can know, for example, if there's a piano in a dark room and somebody's playing the piano, then we will know that there is a piano in that room. Universe nowadays is the same. We have a means of research that uh, is uh, new to us, that in two words, and it explains why this discovery is so important. But then also, to tell you the story from the beginning, I have to start from far, far away. Don't worry, I won't go over everything, but I'd like to start with this notebook. It's Galileo Galilei's notebook, and it's the beginning of modern astronomy. That is to say of astronomy, which is not only seen with the naked eye, but with a first telescope. I don't know if you can read this, if you can read these lines from where you're sitting, but I'll read them to you. This is the original notebook. And on the 7th of January, 1610, for the first time, points uh, his uh, binocular towards uh, uh, Jupiter. He hadn't invented it, uh, the, a Dutchman had, but he had perfected it, and above all, he would looked at it not to look at the ground or what was happening nearby or what was happening in the enemy field or what was happening in the next village. He pointed his telescope upwards towards the sky, and that was a point of non-return. Nothing was like it had been before. And in fact, this January the 7th, 1610, is a date we should all remember. And what does he say? Well, he said on the 7th of January, 1610, Jupiter could be seen, and he calls it with the canon, and three fixed stars, one star and another one and a third star. This is a Jupiter, uh, with, uh, which is marked as Jupiter without, because this is the name that he called his telescope, uh, his binoculars, um, uh, Canon. Without the Canon, I couldn't see any. And then he adds on, and the day after, it appeared uh, like this. And you can see that the three stars are in a very different position. And he also says uh, uh, that they moved on. Uh, but not uh, went back, not in a retrogradal manner. That's what his definition is. On the 9th, they, the sky was cloud, cloudy. On the 10th, this is what we could see. And you can see the three stars, and one is, in fact, in front of Jupiter. The incredible discovery is that he realizes uh, 
that, well, first of all, it's a discovery because no one had seen three points of light until uh, near Jupiter. But he also realizes that these three rotate around Jupiter. In other words, uh, Jupiter is a small so smaller s solar system. And in fact, uh, Copernicus uh, had only recently developed this uh, model where the sun was the center of our universe and not the Earth, and the sun had uh, acquired this privilege in inverted commas uh, uh, to that everything would go back to it. Uh, the rest of it uh, was uh, not uh, uh, like Aristotle had said, uh, starred spheres uh, like diamonds, uh, uh, but it was something different. Uh, and so this crystal sphere, as described by Aristotle, was being shattered because you could see that some objects or stars or luminous points that were rotating and Jupiter was like a small universe. Uh, and this uh, was the first sign of the universal value of gravitation. And after him, we have Newton. And Newton gives a mathematical understanding or reading. Here you can see in this drawing, there is a lot, as everything. Here, this is the law of gravity, and also a, an incredible or amazing synthesis. You can stand on the top of a mountain and throw a stone. You see, the first curve is uh, uh, when the stone falls at um, uh, the bottom of the mountain. If you throw it a bit stronger, and so on, so on, point F, E, F, and then it will fall, but it will no longer fall on the ground. And this stone that you have thrown becomes a part of or joins the Earth's orbit. Now, these thoughts of Newton's um, are essential. Why? Well, because it indicates, and he immediately applied this to the moon, that the moon was falling on the Earth. That's why it was suspended mysteriously in the sky. The Earth is falling on the sun. Luckily, the sun is very small, and we don't fall on it, and so we don't get burnt. But the message that Newton gives us is that the force that makes objects fall on the ground, the same force that keeps us with our feet on the ground, and if we jump, we fall back. This very strong force is the same which we have also in the sky, in the universe. This synthesis between Earth and celestial natures that in up to then had belonged to very different worlds. The nature of the ground of mud was very different from the nature of the uncorrupted sky. While at this point with Newton, all the universe becomes one and all things work in the same way. So by carrying out experiments here, we can see how the universe works everywhere. This is a revolution in itself, uh, which explains why Newton is considered as important as he is. Thanks to this force, uh, which has, can be described by a mathematical formula and that we all know, we can interpret uh, all uh, the uh, movements. Uh, human beings have launched satellites, so we still calculate uh, with uh, Newtonian mechanics. Uh, and clearly, this uh, operates uh, in the framework of the solar system. Then we have this other man, and this six, and he, in fact, puts an end to Newton's success. He sent him up into the attic. And this is a surprise. What did Einstein say? What did he say that was different? Well, first of all, at the time when Einstein was living, which they, when they had already understood what an electrical field was, what an electrical charge was, what electromagnetics were, and how they propagated, and how there was a delay between the source and the target, 
big, which Newton didn't understand, because for Newton, the gravitational field was not free. It uh, had to do with the source. It was linked, it was bound to the source. This didn't work, obviously. There had to, again, be something which led to the delay between the movement and the fact that it was perceived. Furthermore, there were some other more epistemological matters uh, rather than being experiments uh, that were proving that you had to go and uh, review Newton's theory. It was um, the fact that the, the framework, the philosophical framework uh, was being questioned, the fact that the inertial mass, that is to say the resistance to move, which uh, F uh, equals MA, that's the formula, and the gravitational mass, so that is a gravitational charge, uh, which tells us uh, how much, uh, uh, what the strength of attraction is, coincided. For Newton, this coincidence uh, is never explained. And uh, this is uh, Einstein's starting point. Uh, he goes beyond this and uh, finds consequences uh, that he starts on a journey, which brings us to our day and to gravitational waves. Uh, to tell you the story in a world, uh, word uh, on the general relativity principle, I'm sure you know about it, but I'm going to tell you a short story because any explanation of general relativity is a rather daring uh, attempt. Uh, but I'm going to tell you the story just to give you, illustrate one aspect uh, of it, which is what I'm interested in this evening. And to tell you this, uh, the example refers to two people who think that they live on a flat, bi-dimensional uh, plane. They're squashed on it, and they think that it is infinite, that the distance is infinite, because they know geometry, and they also know what parallel lines are. So they decide to carry out an experiment that, if you wish, is rather obvious, uh, to verify that if they start from a certain distance, uh, and they're back to back, uh, and they move perpendicularly and proceed with the same speed, and therefore going along parallel lines. If they remeasure the distance after a while, the distance will be the same. They carry out the experiments, but they see that progressively they're getting closer and closer. So first of all, they, tell, they accuse each other of having cheated. They do it again, but it happens again. When you go in that direction, you tend to get closer and closer. How can you explain it? Well, first of all, the easiest thing is not to question the fact that they live in, on, in a flat land, but to say that there is a force and a force of attraction, which would explain why they're getting closer and closer. This is the Newton-like explanation, while Einstein gives another explanation. And it's another revolution. He says, well, maybe they're not on a flat land. And what if they were on a sphere? It, too, a bidimensional sphere, but starting from the equator and proceeding along a direction which is perpendicular to the one which the other colleague is traveling on, they would naturally meet, but not because there is a gravitational force, but because of the curve of the world they're living on, which is why getting closer and closer is a consequence of deformation, of the curvature of the world they live on. This explanation is not obvious. It's much simpler. Well, the first one, no, actually, the first one is more intuitive because it's very difficult to perceive the geometry of the world we live in, which was Einstein's discovery. We don't live on a flat universe. We don't live on a universe where if we put two parallel laser rays, they go on in parallel. The presence of matter deforms space, creates a curvature, which is why all the bodies feel this curvature and move free from all forces, just like the two little men on the, sp on the sphere. But they're forced, in the course of their trajectory, to follow the curvature of the world in which they live. Clearly, this explanation is an alternative explanation to the one which Newton offers. You can explain it with an equation which I'm not going to illustrate this evening, but I will simply say that 
Geometry is not the one of a flat surface, uh, but it depends. It's, the space-time curvature depends on the mass energy. So, for instance, the sun, with its presence, uh, deforms uh, the space around it. Uh, and uh, why don't they? Why do objects curve around it? Well, because that uh, is what proves uh, that the sun has uh, deformed uh, the geometry of the universe. Uh, planets move freely but forced by the curvature of the space they move in to rotate around the sun, to turn around the sun. This might seem to be Newton's, uh, well, it can be seen an alternative, uh, but uh, one might say, do you favor Newton or do you favor Einstein? Well, Einstein had uh, foreseen some effects that Newton hadn't. Uh, so we carried out experiments uh, to see whether Newton or Einstein were right. Einstein suggested uh, an experiment. Uh, this is the sentence, uh, space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve. And this is by Wheeler. That's it. But if, if it is true that the sun deforms what space, light too should not go straight. This was the experiment of light deflection. You can see that star which is positioned in the lower part. The ray which uh, starts or is emitted by that star does not go straight, but according to Einstein, it should curve. And so seen from the Earth, which is the planet on the right, seen from the Earth, the apparent position of the star is another because the light is curved. I don't see it where it was, but this can be done. And this is what Sir Arthur Eddington did, an extraordinary man, which we don't talk a lot about, uh, but which had this essential importance in this experiment amongst the others. Uh, contributions, uh, he was um, a man for peace. Uh, he refused to fight in World War I. So don't forget what that meant in World War I, and decided uh, to suggest uh, this experiment. He was held in high esteem within the Royal Academy of Science, uh, and he managed to find the funding, which was really extraordinary, because don't forget, a British person who was trying to get the funding for an experiment to prove uh, that an Englishman uh, like Newton uh, was wrong and uh, um, that a young German, uh, that is to say Einstein, uh, uh, was right. And that's while the war was going on. You really had to push for that. He took an expedition to an island of the Atlantic uh, where there was going to be a total eclipse of the sun. And there it would have been possible, given that the sun would have been hidden by the moon, you could see the stars behind the sun, and they should be in a different position from another night. And this uh, was the experiment that they carried out. This is what they did, and this is what he saw. In fact, uh, if uh, the sun was in the middle, the space was deformed, and stars appeared to be more distant as compared to the photos uh, of another night. And this is from the New York Times, uh, in 1919, November 1919, where it says, lights all askew in the heavens, as you can see. The stars were not where they should have been, and uh, that people are, the scientists are really surprised, and that Einstein the Einstein's theory triumphs, the stars were not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but no one need to worry. A book for 12 wise men, only 12 men at the time were aware of the theory of relativity. Of course, Einstein became famous overnight. He was known amongst scientists, but he wasn't the icon or the pop icon that he subsequently became. But he became very famous throughout the world thanks to this experiment. Clearly, it's not just space that is deformed, but also time. 
and gives rise to, to rather spectacular phenomena. That is to say, if you draw a photon towards uh, the higher areas, it loses energy. Clearly, it has to go on uh, at the speed of light, but it can lose energy because it can lengthen its wavelength. Uh, so it starts uh, blue, and by the time it gets to the top, it's red. In fact, it's called red shift, uh, gravitational red shift. This example also tells us the time does not uh, pass at the same rhythm everywhere. The gravitational field can slow time down. And this uh, has some extraordinary effects uh, because um, where there is a strong gravitational field, you're younger. You remain younger for long. Should we all go to the sea then? No, because it's a few milliseconds, really. Um, in the lifespan of a human being, whether you live at the top of a mountain or at the sea level. The demonstration is that if those oscillation, if you consider it like the tick-tock of a quartz clock, the person who is in the strongest area hears tick, 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 sends the signal above saying that this is time and this is how it passes for me. But when it gets to the top, the other one does not hear tick, 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 but hears tick, tock, tick, tock. So the wavelength uh, is much longer. Seen from above, um, all the things that are below appear different from what you see from below it seems accelerated. Um, so we use this every day, this effect, uh, in, uh, with our uh, GPSs, in our navigators in the car, in the sense that they give us um, the position of our car in the road uh, in Turin, because it sends signals and it sends them back, so we know where it is. But time measured by satellites must be modified because of the general gravity theory, uh, because um, this, the general relativity is something we use every day, in other words. Um, this effect uh, on Earth is minute, uh, but if you take it to its extreme consequences, it can be really uh, incredible and enable us uh, to have journeys in the future. So talking about uh, um, gravity, the black hole is the most extreme object, and as it is, I will talk about it because uh, there are two black holes that gave us the gravitational wave signals uh, that we picked up. Reverend Mitchell said this two years ago. If uh, a mass became or becomes very big, uh, the surface gravitational field uh, is very high, very tall and very compressed. It could be so compressed uh, that it will not even allow the light or light to leave it. But normally, light uh, allows, the, allows objects uh, to leave the planet. Uh, for instance, on the Earth, uh, it's 11 kilometers a second. That is to say, if you launch an object with a, a speed exceeding 11.2 uh, kilometers a second, the object will, n will not come down because uh, its kinetic energy will exceed the force of gravitation. That's how we send uh, uh, rockets out to the solar system. The the bigger the planet, or the smaller but more concentrated it is, the greater the speed. So Reverend Mitchell thought, could this become, in fact, greater than the speed of light? And thus, uh, you discuss it, he discovered that if a mass is compressed within a certain radius, which is called Swashen's radius, not even the light can leave it. That object appears completely black, hence the term dark star, which is what initially was, which then became black hole, because black hole is uh, more catchy. Now, this black hole 
for instance, uh, the Earth with all its math uh, would be compressed uh, a, to a ball of one centimeter in diameter, and then it would become a black hole. Clearly, it's not easy to produce a black hole. In fact, artificially, we're unable to produce them. We didn't even know whether they really existed or if it was a theoretical object. But in practice, uh, if the mass is concentrated within a certain value, for example, for the sun, it would be three kilometers. If we were to compress the sun in three kilometers, it would become a black hole. So you have an object which not, not only does not uh, allow light out, but it really doesn't. And it be allowed in. It's an extreme object. Um, and according to Einstein, this also has uh, an extreme curvature of uh, the space time. At, as you see, the sun creates a sort of dip, a deformation in space, and that's the sign that there is a curvature. Then if you take more compressed stars, uh, uh, the dip becomes bigger and bigger. But the black hole has a it has an endless hole towards singularity. So according to Mitchell, who was a follower of Newton's um, he theory, he thought that it was a solid object, remained there and absorbed light. But according to Einstein, if an object enters its uh, Schwarzschild's uh, radius, it becomes a black hole, but the mass, the one which is outside it, will precipitate to the center in singularity. And it is an extreme object, which I will show you. This is a black hole. It's not a joke. Well, maybe it is a bit of it. Can you see the little red dot at the center? It's not That doesn't happen really in a, in a real black hole. Uh, but it, that indicates singularity. It precipitates there and doesn't stop. Matter, which we feel occupies a volume which is difficult to compress. I don't know if you've seen those that crush cars. The cars put in a press, the matter is compressed, and it becomes a little cube while well, it was in a big thing before. But matter, in fact, is empty. And the elementary particles are only concentrates as for space time. It can be compressed to the umpteenth, to the infinite, and occupy virtually no space. That's what Einstein theorized. And all the mass is there. And the black hole is like a soap bubble, a black, empty soap bubble. Very, very heavy, but all the mass is at the center. It's a science fiction object. Does it really exist? Well, first of all, if it exists, if this slowing of time, which is described, becomes a measurable effect, a real effect, which could change our lives, a black hole would make it possible to travel into the future. And to do so, not about a matter of seconds, but really travel into the future. If we were to find a black hole quite close by, it would be conceivable to travel, to travel there around, come back on the Earth, and while on the Earth, uh, uh, 1,000 years have gone by. The person who orbited uh, only spent two years or one month instead of 100 years. You can choose the order of magnitude. It depends how far the black hole is and how massive it is. But traveling in the future, according to the theory of general relativity in modern physics, is possible, and it's possible in this way. But it's not possible to go in the past. But surely it's possible to travel in the future. Another effect, uh, which is funny, because this word spaghettification exists in American English, and it's the effect uh, that an astronaut jumping into a black hole would be, because the gravitational force on his or her feet is bigger than the one on the head. There is this spaghettification effect. Then we have effects that are not forbidden by general relativity, but which appear a bit science fiction. For example, what is this? What happens in this black hole? Nobody really knows, because you can't come out. You can't even send a signal. So at this point, uh, you could uh, unleash your imagination following intuitions 
for instance, uh, might exit another side and another universe. Uh, for example, these uh, endless pits, uh, you could maybe enter one universe and come out on another one. Science and science fiction work together and you could let yourself go and think that the Big Bang, that is to say the explosion of this, we, what something we don't know which became the cosmos, is in fact a black hole somewhere that collapsed and we are a white hole. So you can unleash your imagination, but at a certain point you have to stop because there's no experimental evidence. The only thing that we know today is that a black hole is something human beings can't make, but nature can. When a star collapses at the end of its life because of the force of gravity prevails over uh, the thermonuclear reaction, which at a certain point is exhausted, and this means that the matter concentrates more and more, this uh, might lead uh, to the matter concentrating within. This is what we thought, and this is what we can say we know. What happens? How did we know experimentally about black holes? Well, we knew it because in the sky there are systems like these. That is to say there's a normal star, a mass of gas, which sends matter towards another much smaller one, which, uh, however, draws it in. And we see the gas, so, which forms a spiral and falls within this small body, emitting X and, and gamma rays, photons, in fact, but also that there is an enormous mass uh, and a very small volume. And so we suspect, or we used to suspect, or we did, that there were black holes in the sky not because we were able to hear them with their voice, which are gravitational waves, but because they spoke uh, through the matter before the matter went down them and which sent out signals. And now, at long last, we're down to the gravitational waves. And these objects, uh, such as black holes or neutron stars, uh, um, or the white dwarfs are very compact uh, bodies and when they form spirals so we can hope that they will emit uh, gravitational waves. Uh, that is to say they're able to emit this type uh, of uh, deformation of space uh, at the speed of light. Um, this is what Einstein had for predicted uh, 200 well, a hundred years ago, but Einstein's equation is rather complicated, but in fact it's, sim it's much sim more simple if you allow for perturbations. Uh, at that point it becomes uh, the gravitational waves equation, which we also know because there are waves in the sea, waves in the air, and this wave equation, electromagnetic wave equation, is the one which uh, enables us uh, to understand how a gravitational wave behaves and what its impact is on space. So above, uh, you can see the impact of electromagnetic waves, that is to say, electromagnetic fields that vibrate and spread while the gravitational wave is not, as in the case above, a physical unit or the, where space is just the background. The gravitational wave is the background, the theater, the context, is the space itself that deforms in such a way which is uh, very particular. It's like the sea and which has two polarizations, uh, just like the electromagnetic one, but it is different uh, to the one above. These waves, according to the source, have a different shape. For instance, if I have a continuous uh, wave, it's one thing, while if I have a short note on the piano, I hear it. The, the wave is, has a different shape. So different sources give different shaped waves. For example, right at the top, you can see a supernova that does this, one go, just, which spreads. Then uh, a spinning neutron star gives uh, uh, rise to something which is like a whistle because it rotates very rapidly, it spins. 
Well, the third one is uh, the most important one because uh, it is the one that describes uh, the signal that we picked up, that is to say coalescing binaries, so two objects that spiral together, issue or emit a wave, and then they lose energy. And this means that they get closer. The closer they get, the faster they spin. The fact that they go faster is something you can imagine if you saw an ice skater spinning and puts his or her arms around themselves. It's called uh, the conservation of the angular momentum. You can see it uh, if you, for example, or is this a spinning stool? Otherwise, we could have Bianucci rotating on it. Well, if at home you have a rotating or a spinning stool, do it. You sit on it, uh, you have two full bottles, uh, you hold them and you start spinning slowly and then you put the bottles close to you and suddenly you spin much faster. And then if you put them outside, you slow down again. Beautiful. This is what happens in the cosmos, uh, in the universe. This is what happens, it happens here. The sa it's the same physics throughout the universe. And in fact, uh, two stars that rotate uh, on themselves uh, get faster and faster as they go cl get closer and closer, and then they coalesce. And the signal that you can see is the third graph. That is to say, it starts uh, as a sinus uh, when the signal, uh, the bodies are far from each other. But then the closer they get, the wider they get, but also the frequency increases. In fact, if you want to know what is the signal of the two neutron stars that are going to coalesce, the signal would do something like this. In both cases, uh, it increases uh, both in terms of frequency and amplitude. There's signatures that tell us uh, how important the masses of these two objects are and also tell us at what distance uh, the source is. Because if you know how massive they are, the amplitude will tell us what the distance is. A lot of information that you can have from gravitational waves. Uh, but if you think about it, if I give you the example of a piano in a dark room, if, if you don't know what there's in the room and somebody plays a key, say a C, you know that that's a piano and not a flute or not a human being. And if you have a good ear, you'll know what key it is and you will also know whether it's a good piano or not if you're an expert. There's a lot of information in a wave, and there's a lot of information in a gravitational wave. And in fact, uh, we'll skip these, the effect of a gravitational wave, uh, for instance, uh, on a system which consists of uh, circular masses, uh, if we have a gravitational wave, this is the impact. The oscillation spreads at the speed of life with an effect like this, so, which is like a tidal effect. This is the effect on a student. If you take a person, you invest it with gravitational waves, this would be the effect. But not so easy not so easy in practice because gravitational waves are very, very small. That is to say the effect of a gravitational wave that we could perceive from the source is where space changes by a very small fraction, one billionth of a billionth of a meter. Two points at a meter's distance, uh, we have a gravitational wave, you have uh, a 10 to the minus 18th difference. If you want to know what it's worth, here you have one meter, then if you divide it by 10,000, that's a hair. If you divide it by a million, it's the diameter of an atom. 
But if you divide it by 100,000, you have the nucleus of an atom. And if you divide the nucleus by 1,000, then you have what a gravitational wave detector measures. That is to say, you'll be able to measure a quantity, a deformation, a shift, which is very, very small. This explains why it's taken us 50 years of attempts to be able to see it. And like all mad and crazy attempts, you need a crazy person at the beginning. John Weber was the person who started it all. And he's a rather unusual person. He invented the principle of uh, the maser. And then there was a laser. But um, unfortunately, he was not officially recognized as such. But he's recognized the, as one of the people who made the most important discoveries. At a certain point, he studied general relativity. He, he told me, because I was lucky enough to meet him, and I think many of us were lucky enough to meet him. He, he'd married, and he was a small little boy who was banging against the wooden cradle. And to stop him to do this, uh, he had to stay up at night and look. And he was reading in the course of these uh, nights. Uh, and he read this book uh, on uh, general relativity and gravitational waves. And he started getting involved in these night reading. And he decided what he wanted to do. These waves were so important. Uh, Einstein had uh, predicted them. They could give us information on the masses of the universe uh, and their movement. They could tell us whether they were black holes or they weren't. And so he got involved in this. And although Einstein said when he calculated it, that that effect of gravitational waves was virtually negligible. He used these words, a practically vanishing value. Don't even try, it meant. He decided that he couldn't wanted to measure it. And if this is a vibration, he thought, well, at this point, let's have a microphone, and the microphone will pick it up. But more than a microphone, it was like a diapason. That is to say, something which reacts to the vibration. This is what he carried out. This was a cylinder, like the one he's now leaning on. It's an aluminum cylinder, something which echoed at a fundamental this is 900 hertz uh, uh, at that wavelength. Uh, he covered it in piezoelectric ceramic, uh, which were glued to it. And so when the object vibrated, they reacted with an electric symbol, and therefore it could be amplified and recorded. He put two of these uh, microphones, so to speak, at a distance of a 1,000 kilometer and wanted to see when they played together. If they were excited together, that meant that there was something which was like a gravitational wave, a gravitational wave. He carried out this experiment. He founded these coincidences and told the world in a famous article that he had discovered gravitational waves because he thought that when these cylinders were oriented towards the center of the galaxies, there were more of these uh, waves. So as to say, wonder what there is at the center of the galaxy. It's probably moving. It's generating these vibrations, and I've picked them up. Great uh, surprise, and uh, it was enthusiast, including Italy, started to repeat the experiments, but no one got the same results. So the poor Weber, poor Weber, had just suffered from his whole life uh, that he had said something which wasn't true. But the interesting thing, from the sociological point of view, that all the groups, instead of saying that it was not true and then stopping and doing something, they, in fact, got involved in this and very interested. And so it's true that Weber was not right, but maybe I could perfect it, they said. Maybe I could be put it at low temperatures so I could find a lower um, noise, or I could invent maybe another type of uh, uh, measurement. Uh, so this seed had been sown, and many groups in the world started to uh, build up uh, uh, different uh, types uh, of an Eduardo Amaldi that you can see on the top left, uh, who is near Guido Pizzella, who was the head of the gravitational group, started in the 
this research in the 70s because Italy was always in the front line of this type of activity. And there you can see uh, the one in the Explorer at CERN. There's, I'm there too, very young. Another one in Frascati. And then now Riga in Lignano. And Massimo Certonio directed that. And these uh, worked for many years. Uh, and at a certain point, we felt that maybe there are some coincidences, possibly. But in the end, although we picked up some coincidences, we hadn't really seen it. So we had to develop something else. Other groups had already started to, on a different principle, no longer a diapason, beautiful, very romantic, if you ask me, but bigger ones uh, that were interferometric ones. And since this is a photo, uh, 1988, uh, and since many years had gone by from Weber's experiments, uh, we went to these, uh, we moved on to these interferometers that are two arms, about three, four kilometers with a laser light going back and forth. We all started working on these, even those uh, who were working on other things, they started working on interferometers. Uh, and uh, on the 14th of September 2015, we saw the first signal. Since uh, this, uh, well, allow me, first of all, lots of contributions in this, to this research, uh, but I don't want to waste time, but I want to show you how it works. Can you see that little cylinder? That's, that's a laser, I say. This uh, will project light into that slanted mirror, and it's the beam splitter. It separates light. The light will go straight because this uh, transmits, but it, since it also reflects, it will also go in the opposite direction. Then the two rays will combine again, the two beams, and they will go to the uh, photo, revel photo detector. Instead of so many words, maybe I'll just show you. The laser beam, see what it does? The photo detector can receive light according to how they combine. Let's look at it closer by. You see the wave goes onto that mirror. Partly is transmitted to the mirror at the bottom. The other part was reflected in the other mirror. The two combine, and when they combine, they're in the opposite phase. You have darkness on the light detector. But if you have a gravitational wave, one is stretched and the other one is slower. And so you see that the interference, which was destructive before, becomes constructive. And you have light and dark with the same frequency as the gravitational waves which hit which hit gravitational wave which hits this is a transducer that is to say it transforms the space time vibration into light so it's possible to measure it this is a detector it's called a michelson morley interferometer because of this would they measured uh, the independence of the movement of light uh, from the source, so, so this was historical. But this detector is extremely sensitive. It's highly sensitive. And it makes it possible, in its more modern version, to measure the small shifts which I described. Clearly, this is the principle of how it works. But in practice, it's more complicated, because there are couples or pairs of mirrors. Uh, light goes back and forth uh, several times before before it's measured, which is like having longer arms than what they effectively are. Uh, there are lots of technical solutions, but what decides it in the end, that is to say, if you can me measure or not the gravitational wave, is the sensitivity curve, which you can see in the top right. You have the frequency of the noise of the detector. That's on the x-axis. On the y-axis, uh, you have the strain noise. Uh, the gravitational wave. The lower the curve, that is to say, the the lower the noise, uh, the more the likelihood of seeing the gravitational wave. This class uh, of detectors, uh, uh, there are very few and far apart. Uh, one is LIGO in Washington, and the other one is Louisiana. That's two, and one's in 
Europe, in Italy, and it's called Virgo, it's near Pisa. The two American ones were funded two years before Virgo. Virgo is now reaching its advanced version, but these three detectors of the same class are the ones which are our gaze and our ears. Since the LIGO was the first one to start, here you can see Virgo in Kashina. You can visit it. You can visit the observatory. It's a very interesting experience. You can also see it from the airplane. But these research projects, very beautiful, the cosmos, gravitational waves, where are we, where are we coming, where do we come from, where are we going? But the daily work of a physicist uh, is really sweat and tears, uh, and also identifying the sources, uh, extreme perseverance. Uh, Amaldi used to say, the important quality, people think uh, think it's intelligence, but it's perseverance. So you need continuity, uninterrupted will and drive, uh, and clearly a passion which makes uh, this work, uh, makes you able to withstand the work. Uh, it's, uh, it's only your passion that makes you stand it. Well, here you can see in that curve that I'm showing you to be able to lower the sensitivity, improve it, the fre improve the frequency and reach the lower ones. So they had to, you have to suspend the mirrors perfectly so that they move only when the gravitational waves hit them and not because a lorry or a train or someone else or a storm passes by. And this suspending them on a series of pendulums, it's like pendulums, whatever happens in the lab, it will not vibrate, not easy, at quite the opposite. Uh, at the intermediate frequencies, uh, these are essential to have uh, suspensions uh, and to use materials uh, which are very special, that do not dissipate, very pure ones from an acoustic point of view, and also mirrors that have to be perfect. At high frequencies, you have to use a laser, which is very stable and very powerful. So all these devices and solutions explain why so many years were required. You can't just go on an online catalog and buy the right device for what you need. Everything had to be developed in-house. Uh, and this is how progress uh, continues. That is to say, you have uh, a scientific carrot which is the, the gravitational wave, and at that point you have the stick. And they, that's what the researchers uh, do then to do, reach the carrot. What do they do? They develop technologies, which in any case very often have a fallout uh, on everyday life. Um, so this is the result. This is the publication of the work. Uh, but this is the detail of what happened. On the left, you can see the detector that was in Hanford, the right, the one in Louisiana. The red curve in the top is the beginning. At the beginning, there's time on the x-axis, and initially the curve has the noise of the detector. Every microphone, every detector has some background noise, and you see that. And then at a certain point, that noise becomes a wave. And the shape of the wave uh, tells us uh, that there are two compact objects that are spiraling and coalescing. The other detector does the same thing. And in fact, subtracting the noise, you can see the graph uh, in, on the right. Uh, you can see the signal, the same signal. And what signal arrived? Well, according to the shape of the wave, we don't know what happened. But we know that from the sound of a note, you know what instrument it is. Well, what were the instruments in this case? Two black holes, 136 and 129 solar mass senses that spiraled together the first part of the curve when they're still quite far away. Then they got closer and closer, going faster and faster, and then coalesced. The moment in which they coalesced, their speed was half the speed of, just a bit more than half the speed of life. This uh, certainly, if you're an accelerator, it's not so much a problem, but in two objects like that, it's really something 
we could have difficulty in conceptualizing. The final mass that was formed is 62 solar masses. One was 36 and one was 29. That should be 65, not 62. There are three solar masses that disappeared. Where did they go to? Well, m equals c squared, they, they went to the gravitational energy of the signal. And that is the conversion of uh, mass and energy and the most powerful one that we have seen. You can well imagine that Hir Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs were a few fractions of a gram that were converted into energy. Here you've converted into energy three times the mass of the sun. And what? a telescope on the spot would have recorded is something like this. This is obviously slowed down, but it's realistic. That is to say you have the two black holes uh, with the effect uh, of the curvature of the light rays uh, that are spiraling, getting closer and closer. This is obviously slowed down. You'll, this so It's like a dance, a cosmic dance. And in the end, they coalesce and they form one black hole. That process uh, is without even one ray of light. It happens in the total, in total silence. No X-rays, no gamma rays, nothing. They're two perfect spherical objects. In fact, in a, from a certain point of view, they're the purest objects nature ever made. And the black hole that is formed is there, bearing witness uh, what to what happened naturally. I would also like to show you in a slightly more dynamic matter, manner what has happened. And you, you can see the shape of the wave. Those circular areas, lighter green, are the crests of the waves, of the gravitational waves. This is what happened. The two, this is a bit faster. They coalesced as in a pond, the wave started and the ripples uh, went for a billion, three hundred million light years and they reached the Earth. The Earth too was uh, hit by the gravitational wave and slightly deformed. This is overstated, it's exa vastly exaggerated, don't worry. But this happened. That is to say, the Earth are too deformed at the arrival of the gravitational wave. But this time, there were two detectors, and with, they had the right sensitivity and were able to perceive, to see these. And these were the ones which I showed you before. So this time, we captured it. I wonder how many gravitational waves have already hit the Earth, but we were unable to pick them up. Now, at long last, we're able to. It's like saying how many times looking at the sky you've seen Jupiter and nothing around it. But Galileo, with a new instrument, was the one who was able to see uh, what was happening. That's why we needed these new tools uh, to perceive this. Well, I want to show you this map, because uh, when you say 36 solar mass, 29 solar masses, you might imagine something which is ginormous. Uh, but in fact, they're extremely compressed as I mentioned. So here, compared to a map of Italy, these black holes are a little bit bigger than an Italian region. Possibly you could fit one in Piedmont, but there are 36 solar masses. These objects are two black pinpoints, which are at a billion and 300 million light years, which means that the one, the this is, what happened one billion and three hundred million years ago when uh, there was the earth existed but there was no life on it um, uh, and they were very small we would never have known of their existence uh, had it not been that we have learnt uh, to see gravitational waves we saw others too this representation in terms of solar masses, you see these two families uh, of uh, the brighter blue are those black points that we thought uh, on the basis of the results of a normal star where its mass is absorbed by very small objects. So we knew a 
few dozen objects that did this. And so we said, maybe these are black holes, while the ones on the right are black holes seen with gravitational waves. But the surprise was that they're big. That is to say, there are many more black holes than what we thought, and they're much bigger than what we thought. These were the first surprises that we had on the basis of these early signals. So much so that someone went a bit over the top and thought that maybe the mystery of dark matter, that is to say of the matter that you can't see, but we know that it exists because the gravitational effects could all be black holes. This uh, is uh, something that we will discover knowing how many more signals are arriving. There might be many black holes if they form, were formed at the beginning of the universe uh, when an enormous amount of energy and E equals mc squared was so intense that they generated uh, so many black holes, primordial black holes. Maybe we are immersed uh, in a number of primordial black holes and we didn't know to. It's a bit early to say whether black matter is what we're surrounded by. It's just a suggestion, possibly a bit uh, uh, bordering this. Uh, is, but there's enough uh, for us to say that this field has have developed and is continuing to develop. We're continuing to gathering data from LIGO and from Virgo. And then we will try again to perfect the, the detectors. Next year, all the detectors will be working again. But uh, gravitational astronomy has now started and is on its way. Uh, we also have more ambitious projects, for example, to send the mirrors or in the sky and therefore have a system of interferometers um, uh, orbiting lasers and mirrors uh, orbiting rather than being on the Earth uh, with arms instead of being three or four kilometers, uh, and that's already a problem on the Earth, uh, will be millions of kilometers. Uh, this object is called LISA. And everybody we're think is thinking that it will be built. Uh, there will be gravitational waves uh, that have a much lower f frequency than uh, a Virgo or LIGO, so it'll see bigger and more um, black holes. Clearly, this will be very slow, but 2029 is the date. So we've reached the end of our journey. We started from Galileo's notebook, the beginning of modern technology with photons, with electromagnetic waves, with our eyes. And now we've reached the work where it tells us how we can read the vibrations of the universe. As Proust said, the real discovery is not in seeing new landscapes, but in having importance is having new eyes, because nothing will be as it was. Thank you.